Let me guess. Your home? It was. And it was beautiful. Titan was like most planets. Hello everybody, today in this video I want to talk about the fall of the Sassanid Empire, why they collapsed, and why the Sassanid Empire ended. Now I want to preface this video by saying that it's going to be very long, I split the video into three different parts, I'm going to combine it all at the end, but it's going to be a very long video, it's going to sound like a boring history video, so if you guys are ready to get bored, uh, brace yourselves, I got timestamps down below in the description. Number two, we're only going to be talking about the Sassanid Empire's history, so everything else we're going to pretend like it doesn't even exist. And of that history, we're going to be only talking about things that relate to their downfall. So everything else, extremely brief. So now that we're done with prefaces, I can at least talk about the Sasanian Empire. First and foremost, do any of you guys know what the Sasanian Empire actually is? Well, the Sasanian Empire is one of many Iranian polities that dominated the Iranian plateau. And the Sasanians are interesting in that they're equals to the Byzantines in every single respect, almost taking them out multiple times, but yet they don't have as much spotlight shown on them. And in addition to this, a lot of the information on the Sasanians is uh, pretty much wrong in a lot of instances. So I would like to do my diligence to give this amazing empire credit that it deserves. But with that being said, we can finally talk about the Sasanian Empire a minute in. So first and foremost, let's start with the history of us. Big Bang happens. Big Bang creates rocks. Rocks have water on them. The water has fish in them. The fish eventually get legs. Those fish go on land and they become human over time through evolution or through God. Continents move about and eventually they become the modern setup for our continents now. And that leads on to the creation of the Iranian Plateau. Now humans that are now fully evolved get out of Africa and go and some of them settle into the Iranian plateau and they create the first Iranian kingdoms, villages, towns, hunter-gatherer civilizations, I'm actually starting backwards with that one, creating settled communities and some of these first important kingdoms would be the Elamites and the Medians and eventually afterwards the Persians from Persis who would create the Achmadidian Empire led by and created by Cyrus the Great who would conquer huge swaths of territory and after a couple of centuries the empire would wax and wane in power and after its zenith and its decline Alexander the Great will knock on the door barge in with 40,000 troops and conquer the whole goddamn thing and then afterwards Alexander the Great will get syphilis and then he'll die and then his empire is split up between his four generals the one that inherits most of the eastern and Iranian lands would eventually create the Seleucid Empire. And the Seleucid Empire exists for a couple of centuries and then afterwards during its decline it will get conquered and swallowed up by the Parthian Empire who would barge down the door with hundreds of thousands of horse archers. And it is with the creation of the Parthian Empire that we can finally stop during the fall of the Parthian Empire that we see the creation of the Sassanid Empire. And here is where we can finally start our video talking about the fall of the Parthians. The Parthians will decline in a very interesting way. They'll be dealing with external invasions from both the Byzantines as well as various Turkic tribes. But in addition to this, they'll also face a lot of internal conflict. Ardawan V, after dealing with the Romans and also a Turkic invasion, would then be dealing with a lot of different rebellions in his empire. The worst of these being the Rebellion of Wakalash, who would actually mint coins in his own name, challenging the authority of the Parthian king, and because of this a lot of his enemies would come to the support of Wakalash, so he was always having to deal with Wakalash having a sizable chunk of the Parthian empire under his control. And because of this, Ardawan was completely oblivious to the growing power down south in the Parthian empire. This coming power being of course the House of Sasan, which will later become the Sassanids, who we will then talk about. Now the origins of the House of Sasan are not really clearly understood, but in one narrative that seems to be popular, the Fire Temple priest Pabbag was essentially the ruler of the House of Sasan family. 
Now, Zoroastrianism was a very popular religion among many Parthians in the Parthian Empire, and in addition to this, the Zoroastrian clergy was also powerful, so Tabag in of himself was a very powerful man. This is augmented by the fact that Tabag was able to secure territory that actually housed Akhmadidian ruins, and this makes sense because he was based around Ishtakir in the province of Fars, which also houses Persepolis. And with these ruins, he was able to craft a narrative in which his family were actually direct descendants related to that of the Achmedidians, giving him a sort of story that he could base a lot of his authority, his justifications for rulership. This would also importantly coincide with him allegedly assassinating the governor of Ishtakir and claiming Ishtakir for his own territory, and by claiming the city, he was able to also push out of Ishtakir throughout the entire province of Fars, securing it, so that by the time Ardashir, his son, when he was able to inherit the throne, he would already have the province of Fars under his control. And with Ardawan distracted, well, the gate was all clear for Ardashir. With Ardashir I now at the helm of the House of Sasan family, the Sassanids would push out of Fars and conquer adjacent territories around him, and when Ardawan finally figured this out, he would then send army after army to try and stop the Sassanids, but they would be defeated, and Ardawan V would have to go and fight the Sassanids with himself and his I'm own army. Myself. Now, at the Battle of Hormoz Gone, the two monarchs would be facing off against each other. Hardawan would have a much larger army, but less well-equipped forces, and Ardashir would have 10,000 cav, but would have flexible chain armor akin to that of the Romans. And also, Ardashir would arrive to the battle earlier and take a more advantageous position, so he was tactically and also militarily superior to that of his enemy who was numerically superior. At the battle itself, Ardawan would be killed and Ardashir following the battle will then deal with Wakalash, kill him, and then push throughout all of the Parthian Empire, capturing as much territory as he could, primarily focusing on the Iranian Plateau. Now, he would incorporate the Parthian nobility in a confederacy of sorts, where the contract would be that the king would leave the Parthian lands alone in exchange for Parthian nobility to provide armies, wealth, and generals. Now, the Sassanids would be able to consolidate control over the various Parthian families by marrying into them, and the Parthian families would also do this with the Sassanids in order to improve their own family's standing. In addition, if a Parthian nobleman ever got too frisky with the Sassanids, then the Sassanids could task a different Parthian family to engage that rebelling Parthian family and ax them off completely. And they did this numerous of times to try and stop the Parthian families from gaining too much power, pitting Parthian family against Parthian family. This manipulation was needed as during this time, as well as for a large chunk of the Sassanid Empire, most lands and most manpower would be owned by the Parthians. Now there were historically seven Parthian families, who we will discuss later, some of them are not as important to the narrative, so I'll bring up the appropriate family when needed, but just know that it was very rare for these Parthian families to see eye to eye, in most part, they were divided, either through religious disputes, trade lines, claims to lands, regional rivalries, or killings between each other that create future conflict. And the the Parthian families only saw the Sassanids themselves as the true heirs to the throne, so the Parthian rebellion for the throne was very rare and until the events that we will talk about later down the line. Now, the Sassanids and the Parthians would ebb and flow in power during this period, from the foundation of the empire to the events of the video that we're going to talk about later down the line. However, the Sassanids were able to always maintain control of the throne. They would never ever have complete control of the empire, as evidenced by the confederacy, but it was more of a decentralized state anyway, with greater autonomy given to the Parthians, as opposed to how it was treated conventionally, with the Sassanid king having complete control over the empire. But during the reign of Balash, actually, things would start to change for the worse in 484. Now, Balash would inherit the throne from his bro Peruz, who would die at the hands of the Hephalites, and he would actually be ruled over by Sukra, who was installed previously by Peruz as Minister of the Empire. Now, upon Peruz being killed, Sukra would go to the Hephalites, defeat their armies, and kill the Hephalite king, 
and Sucre, after about four years, was able to install Quebec as ruler. The Parthian families were never able to contest the throne, but they did exert influence on the Sassanid kingship, and they were able to depose the Sassanid king in favor of picking a different person from the house of Sasan. And we'll see more of this later. So. Effectively, by being able to install Kobad, he was the true leader of the Sassanid Empire, as nobility and individuals would go through Sukra instead of Kobad. The amount of power that Sukra had was massive, and a lot of this was due to the fact that he was able to gain a lot of prestige and respect from the victories that he gained over the Hephalites, a really huge problem that Kobad would have. And essentially what he would do is, after about five years of Sukra's massive power that he had over Kobad, Kobad would exile Sukra to sustain his own homeland. But once there, things would continue as Sucre would still have massive power. People would give him tribute instead of the king, from nobility to the Sassanids themselves, like different family members. He would tell people that he installed the king, and combined with the already existing prestige that he had, it led to many of the great Parthian families giving support to Sucre instead of the king these Parthian families being the lifeline of the Sassanid Empire. So he couldn't do really anything about the situation. And if Kobad wanted to fight Sucre directly, then Sucre would just destroy him in battle or send in one of the many supporters until he met Shapur Razi, the Mihran leader of the Mihran family. Now Shapur was able to gather up a coalition of Sucre's rivals and enemies, as well as rivals from Sucre's own Karen family. And this illustrates what we will see later of the Sassanid kings being used in these dynastic wars between different Parthian families, with this being the Mihran fighting the Karens, and Shapur with his allies will later engage Sukra, being able to capture him and then execute him, ending the Karen hold on the empire. Even with Sukra defeated, the Karens still had a lot of sway in the Sassanid Empire, and the Mihrans were now coming in to fill the void that Sukra left behind. So, because of this, Kobad was never able to quote unquote have full control over the Sassanid Empire until something known as the Mazdagite Rebellion. Now we get on to the Mazdakite Rebellion, and the Mazdakitism was a religion very popular among lower classes of people as it preached an end to the rigid class structure of the Sassanid Empire. The empire was classically understood as being divided between the king, nobility, clergy, and the lay people. And Mazdakitism, you guessed it, was very popular among the lay people. Now, Kobad would use the growing religion in his own ends in order to lay out some reforms to curb Parthian power by supporting a popular uprising. One thing to realize is that one of the ten of Mazdakitism is the communal sharing of women, and due to lackluster forms of contraceptives at the time, there would be a lot of babies. And because of the lack of respect for the class structure between different classes, all four groups would be banging each other. And more importantly to our discussion, the different Parthian families would also engage in this, with families getting down and dirty with even their regional rival. But this had a side effect, and this was that the children that were born through these Parthian families getting together would be able to claim different dynastic lands, and by being able to trace their lineage to different families, they would use these claims to grab territory from their rivals, causing some families to grow in size and power, while others were completely destroyed. Keep in mind, the big families that were more powerful did not get wiped out, and the rebellion itself didn't have any long-lasting changes besides weakening the Parthian families, but during this chaos, one important reform Quebec would pass would be catastral surveys, so that the monarchy could check how many tillers each Parthian family controlled, creating accountability for the amount of wealth a Parthian family was supposed to provide, problem that we will see much later on during Hosro's reign. Now, Hosro is classically known as a great centralizing king, and he would attempt to do some centralizing and rein in the Parthians more than anyone else, so big problem. First reform he would introduce would be to check the manpower of the Parthians, much like the tillers in the catastral surveys. Now, this was due to the Parthian families not giving out correct forces of the manpower the Parthians would send, sometimes giving 100 horses instead of 1,000, sometimes sending in archers without bows or paying swordsmen the same as cavalry members, or sending peasants instead of trained soldiers, or sending horses with no mounts, and this would lead to, well, a need, right, for some oversight. So he would send out attendants to do this work of oversighting the Parthians, and remember, the Parthians were given autonomy and had access to wealthy silk trade and just had to give the required forces, so they were cheaping out the Sassanids big time. 
Now, this is overall a lot more oversight than the Parthians were used to, but the system did work initially, and the issue was that the system was prone to corruption and abuse, with the attendants taking too much manpower or too much wealth, and from the Parthians, and also the Parthians would sometimes make separate deals with the inspectors, allowing them to continue their operations, leaving them alone, give the attendants a piece of the pie, and these problems were never addressed by Hosro. Now, the second reform would follow the same way, Hosro would divide the empire into four parts and task a Iran spa bed, with leading the military forces there. Do keep in mind too that the partition of the army into four groups was also an idea of Kavad as well in one of his reforms, so this is just his son continuing the reforms of his dad. An attempt to weaken the traditional Parthian armies and defend the large Sassanid empire, but it didn't do anything as Parthian families would still be appointed in these positions and would sometimes still rule their homeland to the ire of their regional rivals, and some would rule lands they had no business in at all, with those families losing the lands that they once coveted being at the mercy of a different family, and it drastically increased the factionalism of the empire with different armies putting all their forces alongside these Iran spa bed armies. And you know, these ever increasing reforms would make certain Parthian families, particularly in North and Northeast, lose faith in the Sassanids as the whole basis of the confederacy were the Parthians were being left alone, and Hosro's attempt at turning the decentralized state into a centralized state was leading to the empire's demise. Now, the last change Hosro would make would be making a standing army loyal to the monarchy made up of leftover children from the Mastagite Rebellion and from all the nuclear acquired manpower, but this army sucked as it had no support from the Parthian families, terrible at fighting Turks, and no nomadic people, and armies that the um, Parthian families were way more experienced at fighting. Overall, Hosro made only halfway changes that ended up pissing off the Parthians more than changing things for the better, but with the reign of his son, things would get much, much worse. Now we get on to Hormoz IV. Now if Hosro was the one to lay out the dumpster, then Hormoz would be the one to set on fire. Continuing his dad's reforms, he would cut the pay of the Parthian family members serving in the army and reduce the cavalry that the Parthians could control. But the worst thing that he would do would be to start executing and murdering different Parthian nobles in a way to get rid of the Parthians' control over the monarch, and he would apparently kill 13,600 members of different families. But he didn't completely wipe them out, as he still needed their support, like Vin Duyi or Vistan who we will talk about later. One way he would kill off these members is by classically having dynastic battles, so you'd have like different families battling each other for supremacy because of the orders of the king. And now this will all come to a head when we get to Bahram Chubin, a Parthian dynast, who was tasked with killing off many Parthian family members until after being constantly pressured by Hormoz, revolted against him. Now Bahram would control the northern Spabed army inherited from his grandfather, and he would actually be instrumental in helping Hosro I against the Byzantines, as well as in Hormoz IV, helping out against the Hephalites, earning him a lot of prestige and a lot of respect. In fact, against the Hephalites, he would cross the Oxus River, destroy the Hephalite armies, and kill the king. And this augmented his prestige to legendary status. So Hormoz would, after this point, start harassing Chubin. And because Hormoz feared Chubin's growing power, he wanted to ax it. But Bahram, upon hearing this, rebelled. Now, there's a common legend in which Bahram Chubin rebelled because Hormoz IV sent him a dress and this was meant to be an insult on his masculinity because Bahram Chubin lost against the Byzantines. Usually, a ruler would insult someone or defame them or smear their reputation following a loss, and Bahram Chubin lost big time against the Byzantines. But you know what? I mean, assassin dresses embedded with all these types of silks and beautiful colors. I mean, I think it could be looked at as like a really rich gift. Well, either way, Bahram Chubin either rebelled because of his emasculinity or because Hormoz IV wanted to ax him. He would actually have a lot of support from the Parthian families in North and Eastern Iranashah as they grew tired of the Sassanid centralizing and murdering policies. His own court would actually delay Hormoz into doing anything, and this was due to the court's plan to get rid of Hormoz IV in a coup led by Vistam and Vinduyi, two Parthian dynasts, who wanted to avenge the killing of their dad Asparapet at the hands of Hormoz. Now, Hormoz would talk to his son Hosro in what to do, but Hosro would not want to do anything, as besides the support that they got from the double Vs, they had no one else to rely on against Bahram's rebellion. Now, because of this position and Bahram minting coins in Hosro's name, this would make Hormoz paranoid of his son wanting the throne. Now, Bahram 
Prime did this because, again, the Parthians did not see themselves as rulers of the Empire, even though, because of the Mazdakite Rebellion, some Parthian dynasts could trace their lineage to the Sassanids. So, in fear of his safety, Vistam fled the Sassanid Empire to the Byzantine Empire with Hosro while Hormoz captured Vinduyi. Afterwards, with the help of Vistam's forces and Armenian nobility, they were able to stop Bahram's rebellion, and then afterwards, they deposed, blinded, and killed Hormoz IV, starting Hosro II's reign. How blinding was done would be they would take a hot poker, stick it in someone's eyeball, and then it would pop. Or they would just like take the poker and just rip out the eyeball like that. Either way, they blinded and gouged out uh, Hormoz IV's eyeballs, and then he was killed. Once Hosro was on the throne, he was again at the mercy of Parthian dynast Vinduyi and Vistam, reminded by both of them that he's only on the throne because of them. True in many ways, but it pushed Hosro to kill the two uncles. We could get into more murder, we should talk a little bit about the effects of Bahram Chubin's revolt. It pushed a distinct Parthian identity among the Parthian families that sided with Bahram Chubin. This was called Palav and was heavily concentrated in North and Northeast Parthian homelands, where their whole ideology revolving around a lessened role of the monarch and more Parthian friendly changes such as moving the capital to Ray Parthian homeland in the north. Now Hosro II's reign will start around 590 and soon after the start. Soon after after making Vinduyi as minister and making Svistam spa bed of the east, he would attempt to get rid of both of them. Now, he succeeded in killing Vinduyi, but Vistam would actually rebel at an opportune time, attracting many of the previous rebelling Batram Chubin's army. In addition, more Parthian dynasts would give support to Vistam as a result of her frustration against the Sassanid monarch's policies, and as a result, the northern and northeastern portions of the empire would seed off and become independent for seven years. Now, Hosro will use an Armenian nobleman by the name of Sembat Bagrutani to stop Vistam's rebellion. He briefly served with the Byzantines, but after a failed rebellion, he was banished and ended up at the Sassanid court at around 606 or 607 CE. After Hosro and Vistam had a battle that ended in a draw, Sembat would later engage Vistam with Armenian nobles loyal to him. In this battle, he would end up killing Vistam, but Actually, because of the amount of support that he had with the Parthian noblemen, the rebellion actually continued and Sembat would have to continue putting down remnants of this rebellion. Now, this concludes the first part of this three-part series. I've wanted to do just one video, but I felt like it would be way too long, so I decided to cut it down into three parts. So this is the first part, the Parthian drama with the Sassanids. The second part will be the last great war of antiquity. Then the next part after that will be the Islamic conquest. So I'm going to do it down by that. And then afterwards, when I'm done with these three videos, I will combine them into one video. So that's easier for you guys to watch. Stay tuned because the second part should be out soon. Okay, now that I'm finally done talking about all this context, I can finally talk about The Last Great War of Antiquity. Now, most videos, books, TV shows will start here as to what caused the fall of the Sassanid Empire, and it makes sense because this is during the Sassanid Empire at their zenith of power. And during this war, they will get to the largest territorial extent that they've ever been able to achieve, rivaling that of the Achmedidians. So ultimately, this was a period where the Sassanid Empire was at its climax, and it's here that we will see its massive, massive fall. Now, again, the reason why I wanted to explain the Sassanid Parthian struggle is because without explaining and understanding that the Sassanids and the Parthians had one hand of the steering wheel of the giant truck that is the Sassanid Empire, you'll never understand why exactly the Sassanids fell apart so easily during the war, what happens later on with their conquest by the Arabs. And also, spoiler alert, but the war goes very well for them, and it's only towards the final events of the war and the final years that we see a massive, massive reversal. Now the war would begin from the Byzantine dynastic struggle. The Emperor Maurice was killed by Polkas, actually a rebelling centurion of the Byzantine army. When Maurice was killed, one of his children would attempt to flee to the Sassanid capital, and with the pretense of installing his son onto the throne, the Sassanids would wage war against the Byzantines. The Byzantines and the Sassanids have warred many times, so this was not an unusual thing, but the length of the war was definitely unusual. From 603 
to about 6.30, and the amount of resources the Sassanids would ask of the Parthians would exhaust the empire to its breaking point, leading to Parthian frustration and empire-wide exhaustion for the Sassanids, and this would lead to lack of manpower, veterans, equipment, etc. Now, the war is broken up into three distinct phases. The first phase, 603 to about 609, will focus on the Sassanids advancing deep and capturing Western Mesopotamia and the Caucasus, pushing into Armenia as a diversionary front. These forces were led by Shahin and Hosro II. Now, from 610 to 621, we have the second phase. This is where the Persians strike deeper and deeper into northern Syria, going into Anatolia and reaching the Bosphorus in 615, then simultaneously pushing into southern Syria, capturing Jerusalem in 614, later Egypt from the Byzantines. Now specifically the battles aren't important here, they deserve their own focus, however it's towards the end of the second phase and the beginning of the third that we start to see a reversal of fortune for the Persians. Now it's the end of the second phase where we have the Persians divided into three armies. We have the Army of the East, the Army of the South, led by Chavarez, and then we have the Persian Army in the North, led by Fado Khan. But he would also be taking orders from his dad, Fado Kormos, who had a control over his dynastic family, right? He was the family leader. And now Chavarez was actually related to Vistam, so also keep that in the back of your mind as well. It's with these three armies the Persian forces were concentrated in, and Hosro at this time was solely focused on the Byzantines with Sambat holding together the Sassan Empire with as many rubber bands as he could muster, that this is where we're currently at in the current military structure. Shahin was currently in control of occupation forces in Alexandria and Nubia, which kind of nullifies him altogether. Now, Fado Khan was in charge of pushing into Anatolia towards Constantinople with Shafarez controlling Palestine, Syria, Western Mesopotamia, and Southern Anatolia. Fado Hormoz's family, along with Fado Khan and Rostam, will come up later, but they're a Parthian dynastic family that's related to the Medes or Media dynastic line, so a completely different Parthian family that will now come up in much importance, of course. Now, with these individuals, will actually revolt against Hosro II, and we don't know exactly why. And in the books I have read, it changes with Chavarez seeking out Faro Khan, then teaming out or flipped for Faro Khan seeking Chavarez. It's very possible that Hosro II wanted to axe Faro Khan or possibly Chavarez, more likely Chavarez, after the failures and the defeats that the Sassanids were facing during the third phase of the war, actually. So that would include even the famous Siege of Constantinople, which, I mean, that never worked out because the Persians couldn't really even get their forces over to the other side. This could be the catalyst for why Hosro wanted to kill one of his generals were because of their failures. We have many more stories as well that detail different instances. There's also one narrative that states that Heracleus might have bribed one of the generals, which would actually be Heracleus and Chavarez, but I think more than likely these generals came on their own accords with Heracleus instead of Heracleus convincing them both. For example, in this one story, Hosro II was annoyed at Chavarez for taking too long in Syria. After being frustrated with him, he then sends messages to Fado Khan to kill Chavarez. But after refusing to kill him, Hosro II would then ask Chavarez to kill Fado Khan. And failing to kill this uh, said man, he then is about to do it, and when Fado Khan shows off the letters to Chavarez giving him orders to kill him, and after producing a second set of letters with more instructions, Chavarez pledges to kill Hosro. And in Fado Khan's story, it's exactly the same, and the, these two versions of the story highlight Hosro asking his generals to kill each other because relations were breaking down between either one of them or both of them. It's very funny because instead of his objective to kill them, it was probably the worst case scenario that two thirds of the army basically rebelled and now this combined with Hosro II's uh, treatment of Vistam and Vinduyi still fresh in the minds of people, it didn't really help out. We will explain the Persian army in the east later on but just keep in mind the situation that's brewing. Now, both Fado Khan and Chavarez would never outright rebel, they just never engaged Emperor Heraclius, really encouraging him and having a free hand in the Sassanid Empire. Now, Hosro didn't know about this, and ordered Fado Khan and Chavarez to climb down on both sides of the Heraclius' army, with Chavarez and Fado Khan, and by extension, Fado Komo was not listening to his commands, there wasn't a lot for him to do and save himself, as Rostam, also Fado Khan's brother, was also rebelling in the Sassanid Empire in a proper Irana Shah, so that doesn't help. And 
in some sources, Hulsfrow also asked the generals to cull their mutinous elements in their army, and when the order was enlisted to, a lot of the nobles and high member clergy panicked as what was to come. Now, Pharaoh Komos during this time would try and convince many of the religious elite and the nobility on what should be done and who should be the next Shaw. Spoilers for this part in the anime, the next Tassanic king would be Shiryoyi Kwebad, who was funny enough during the war imprisoned by his dad. Now, Shahin sided with Shah Fares during this whole endeavor, and Hosrul II had a falling out with Sambat Bagrutani's son. Most of the Parthian dynasts at this point did not like Hosrul II, first and foremost because the war was exhausting them to breaking point, and also because a lot of them were pissed off still at Vistam and Vinduyi and their killing. And in addition to this, Farrakh Khan, as well as Farrakh Komos, cozying them up to the idea of rebellion didn't help as well. So Parthian families like the Kanarangians who weren't part of the Palaf faction would ally with them in order to depose Hosrul II. Now the army in the east, or the army of Nemruz, was secretly mutinous towards assassins, and this would be an army under the control of the Surin family in Sistan's uh, sovereign Iran, and because of their close proximity to assassins, in terms of bloodline and location, they saw themselves as different to the Palaf faction in the north, and created a new Parthian faction was supportive of the Sassanid rule, calling themselves the Parsig. A big difference between the two factions, I think that'll make it easier for you guys to remember, is that the Parsig would make coins out with the face of the Sassanid king. The Palav would just make a face out of the Parthian dynast in control of the Palav forces. Now the Parsic faction would not help the king because of the murder of a Mardan Shah who was earlier spot bed of the army of the east. And because of a prophecy foretelling an individual from the east challenging him and because of his great prestige, there was no equal to him so to prevent his paranoid delusions from coming true, he cuts off the Mardan Shah's hand stopping him from challenging Hosro. And Hosro will regret this and try to make things right but the Mardan Shah after being humiliated would ask to die and he would be granted that wish and that would be the primary reason why the Nimruz faction did not like Hosro. Now, 622 to 628 is the final phase of the war, with Heraclius moving into Transcaucasia, then moving through Azerbaijan and Armenia, sacking Zoroastrian religious sites like Ganzak and Ardur Gushnat, and also, in addition to this, striking Parthian cities along Media, Azerbaijan, Armenia, etc. Now, regardless of the stories that I have told you guys, it would be Chavarez to initiate the mutiny, and Hosro was no dummy, he knew a mutiny was coming, but he couldn't really do anything about it. He relied on Chavarez and Farrakh Khan's army to win his war. Uh, Farrakh Khan's bro, Rostam, would actually rebel before Heraclius would invade Persia in 624, so he couldn't axe Chavarez or Farrakh Khan because they could indeed actually turn around, ally themselves with Rostam, and make the rebellion even more problematic for the Sassanid state. Keep in mind, he also didn't know that Farrakh Khomos had this six-dimensional chess-like plan where he was using Farrakh Khan and Rostam to pretty much undermine and destroy Hosro II. And what Heraclius does invade in 624, Farrakh Khan just parks his army in Azerbaijan and just watches them go by. And Chavarez, he's ordered to recall back to defend against Heraclius, but he mutinies. This allows Heraclius to attack key Parthian and Sassanid cities as well as destroy holy Zoroastrian religious sites. So Persia and to a lesser extent Hosro is at the mercy of these armies and Heraclius. And in 626 to 627 in the second invasion, then Farrakh Khan as well as Chavarez would publicly mutiny. So from 624 to 627 you see two mutinies, one rebellion, and a giant invasion destroyed Sassanid Empire. And on February 628, Hosro would be deposed and Shuryoyi Kwebad would come to the throne for the Sassanid surrender. The letter would be sent to Ganzak deep into Faru territorial control, so the Byzantines were just parking themselves right there waiting for the surrender of the Sassanids. Mir Homos, he would be the one to actually kill Hosro, the son of the Mardan Shah. So it's amazing um, circle of life going on here, with Hosro being happy since he still regretted killing Mir Homos' dad. And this would come from an order from Shiri Kobat after he, having his hand tied behind his back, forced by the manipulations of Farrakh Homos and the nobility to, in order to kill his dad so that they could promise their service to him, or they would rebel just like they did with his dad. So really fucked up stuff. But we finally get on and over with this chapter 
of messed up Sassanid history. Now, I know I haven't really focused too much on battles or formations or tactics or technology at all, but that's because ultimately in this war, none of those mattered. You can have all of those things, but if two thirds of the army are going to rebel because you're pissing off the generals, then you can have all of those advantage and still lose. And this is basically what happened to the Sassanids. They were winning for the first 20 years of the war. And it was only during the last, I don't know, 10, maybe even six or eight years of the war that they end up losing the war and this was without a decisive military conflict so let's review Hosro the second is probably the biggest dummy ever because he just pushed things way too far Hosro the second actually had an opportunity to end a war at about 614 to 615 when the Sassanids conquered Egypt and they reached the Shao Sedan right in Anatolia and they were just about to engage in their, you know, more conquests, more campaigning, pushing through and maybe laying siege to Constantinople. They were just about to do that when Emperor Heraclius would try and negotiate with the Sassanids, maybe ceding off some territory, but ultimately his idea was that he would make the Byzantine Empire a client state of the Sassanid Empire and be considered a son instead of a, you know, an equal to Hosro II. But Hosro rejected this negotiation and he would continue the war and he continued and continued and continued and I honestly do not know why but it's obvious that he got way too cocky and he thought he could make the Achmedidian Empire again and damn well he was close to doing it and heck like if he just ceded off some territory and made the Byzantines a tributary state or a client state then that would have accomplished that like goal would it not? But no, he got way too cocky. And even Assassins at their most powerful, it doesn't matter how powerful they are if most of their army is controlled by Parthian dynasts and Hosro II pisses off the Parthian dynasts because they just use those powerful armies against the Sassanids, which ended up happening. It's just funny because most sources and most books and movies, they don't talk about like all these rebellions happening at the same time I mean, from 640, 646, 627. I mean, no, 624 to 627, my bad. Um, they don't talk about all these rebellions, they just say that the Byzantines and Sassanids lose, the Byz Sassanids are so close to winning, but the Byzantines just kind of circumnavigate through the Black Sea, go through Armenia, and then just beat up the Sassanids, which does happen, but it doesn't happen because of the Byzantines, it happens because of the Parthian dynasty letting them just go to town, which is funny. It is ultimately funny that a victory that a lot of people attribute to the Byzantines is caused by the Parthians and to an extension the Parthian Empire. So it's just it's just hilarious and Hosro II's cockiness really lost him the war ultimately. He could have had it all but at least now he's having nothing six feet under. Actually not six feet under because Zoroastrians they take bodies and they dump them in these towers of silence and then afterwards crows and like birds peck at the dead bodies until they're wiped clean. So yeah, he's not six feet under. Now, this concludes the second part of what destroyed the Sassanid Empire, and it's going to be into the third and final part that we'll talk about the last chapter, the last thing that really destroys the Sassanid Empire. That would be the Islamic conquest of Iran, and I'll talk about the effects of the Last Great War of Antiquity in that video. So, subscribe to see that. See you guys soon. Bye-bye. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. So as argued in this video, the Sassanid fall is a multi-step process, this part the end of the Sassanid rocky relationship, the blunder that is the last great war of antiquity, finally the Islamic conquest of Iran, and the after effects of the last great war of antiquity was again general exhaustion, lacking in manpower, equipment, troop, experienced fighters, forcing new recruits to come from untrained populations, and the amount of resources the Parthians had to provide, tons of resources of all kinds to the war effort, just left them exhausted. The biggest side effect would be the massive divide begin between the Parthians in the Patlev group, destroying any way for the Sassanids to mount an effective defense against the Arab and what to do with the Empire in a very short span of time. Now, I haven't talked about my sources till now because the type of discussion should be at the end of the video for clarity, but I will talk about one book that I've referenced a lot of, and that would be a book by Parvanan Porsharyati, in which she talks about the new timeline for the Islamic conquest of Iran. This timeline argues that the Islamic conquest starts at the reign of Queen Buran instead of King Yazgrim, the last assassin monarch. I don't want to go into too many details, but feel like I would be misrepresenting your argument, but I'll summarize my feelings on the sources that I used in this video at the end of the video.
In any case, the new timeline from 628 to 632 means that the Arabs were attacking during the reign of Queen Buran in the middle of the dynastic conflict going on between Chavarez, Parsig, Palav groups, Yazgrid at the time was uh, probably just about 8 years old instead of an adult like most people say. So he was never the savior of the Sassanid Empire and the timeline also brings up a crucial thing and that would be Prophet Muhammad being alive during the Islamic conquest of Iran, leaving many questions unanswered like how much influence did the Muhammad place on the conquest of Iran? It's possible that Muhammad gave the original order to conquer Iraq instead of Abu Bakr, and I say Iraq because as the Muslim forces objective was not the complete conquest of Iranashah or the Sassanid Empire, the Islamic conquest was focused on trade areas of the Sassanid Empire, primarily Samarkand and Iraq, like trade enterpots in uh, Iraq and um, well, what would be considered near Samarkand, Central Asia, essentially, near the Oxus River. So that would be the important parts, and it would reflect a lot on the behavior of the Arabs later in the narrative. So from 628 to 632 is where we see this massive dynastic struggle between the Parsic and the Palav putting different Sassanid family members on the throne. So we will see many different Sassanid family members being part of the Palav or being part of the Parsic camps. And we'll even have Chavarez, like, kind of squeeze on there in his third faction, allying himself with the Parsic, but that won't last for too long. So ultimately, we have a situation in which the Sassid Empire is constantly changing to different kings and different queens. For now, 628 starts his dynastic struggle with Shiriyi Kwabad taking stage. And during his reign, Quabad would do absolutely nothing at all. <laughs> the Parsic and the Palavs signed a peace treaty with the Byzantines, and Quabad would actually be looked over by a new minister, Feruzid, or Peruz in some sources. And Peruz was installed by the Parsic, and along with this and his involvement in the treaty, it shows attempts at the two factions at cooperating with. However, Quabad was not in control of the empire in any capacity, which means the most famous fact of him killing all of the possible heirs to the throne must have been done by Feruzid. Now, why? Would they do this? And a possible answer could be to limit the possible challengers to the Parsic and Palav camp, axing off as many possible Sassid monarchs and dynasties who could disrupt the factions that are now in place. Because once in power, these factions will not give it up. In any case, most of the Sassid dynastic line would be wiped out, all the male heirs, being Quabad the child king Ardashir later on, we'll talk about him, two sisters, Azor Dumak or Azar, and Buran Dumakt, or Buran, and even younger Yazgrid as well, taking kind of a little bit of a spotlight here. So at the signing of the peace treaty with pa Palav and Parsig, delegates like Feruzin and Farukormos, Sassanids and the Byzantines would agree to re-establish borders and a return to the status quo with the old borders before the last great war of antiquity. Now Chavarez would delay his signing of the peace treaty until Emperor Heraclius would meet him, and then afterwards would agree to leave Greek-occupied territories. Now, the Byzantines only asked for the status quo because they feared a power vacuum being created from the weakening Sassanid state, and it's obvious from the Palav Arsic delegates that were at the signing of the peace treaty that the Byzantines pretty much knew that the Sassanid Empire was in a very, very terrible dynastic struggle. Now, Chavarez was not able to get any support from Palav or Parsic forces, and these two groups had good relations with outside forces like the Armenians, isolating Chavarez. And Heraclius knew this and wanted these dynastic families to fight among them, so Chavarez would ally himself with the Byzantines in lieu of the lack of support from these groups. And Shirio Yi Quabad would actually only rule for a couple months and then was killed by the plague. And because of this, Ardashir III, a child, would be put on the throne by Fado Kormoz, and the Parsic group would install. Ferozin as the minister of the king, but this actually angered Chavarez because he was not consulted at all, and then he made an alliance with Parsig and moved on to the Sassanid capital while Ferozin opened the gate for him and his forces, deposing Ardashir III, killing him and his supporters. He then made himself king in 637 CE, but his rule would only last for about 40 days as he had no support from the Parthian nobility as none of the Parthians wanted another Parthian member to rule over the Sassanid Empire and he killed off a lot of elite that supported Ardashir III which made him very unpopular. He would only rule for about again 40 days and then afterwards Farouk Zod would later kill and install Queen Buran as ruler with the support of his dad Farouk Hormoz with Farouk Hormoz later on being made chief minister of Queen Buran. 
Now, in this short time span, with Quebec, Ardashir, Chavarez, each minting coins in their own name, each sending around diplomats to announce the new king, different groups knew of the dynastic struggles of the Sassanids, and the Arabs, having raided the Byzantine and the Sassanid frontiers during the end of the last Great War of Antiquity, definitely noticed the weaknesses of both of the empires, in addition to the fact that there was a lack of buffer states like the Lachmids and the Gashanids, and the ever-decreasing garrisons on the frontiers. So basically this leads on to the first battle between the Arabs and the Sassanids at the Battle of Ubala in 628 CE. Now the Persians were too preoccupied with their dynastic events and struggles to deal with the invasion at all. Basically it ends up in a loss and the next battle see that the Parsic forces are trying to get reinforcements and they end up getting reinforcements from Palab forces actually. And this causes the ne this battle and the next one to be bogged down as the two separate armies argue over what the game plan should be in dealing with the Arabs resulting in a defeat after defeat after defeat. And during the events of Chavarez's rebellion, many generals and armies would leave to go defend Ardashir, leaving behind forces to deal with the Arabs resulting in yet again more defeat. Now, the Arabs will eventually take the whole Al Hira region through a combination of warfare and diplomacy, and the Arabs would later send out letters to all assassinated parties calling for peace and an end to warfare. Now, during Chavarez's reign, he would actually try and stop the Arabs, but he would use an army as described as keepers of swine and chicken and end up losing the battle. Now, Chavarez only had support at this time from his own occupation forces, so he faced a lot of manpower issues with dealing with the Arabs, leading to an Arab victory. When Buran was made queen, however, no order of hers was actually followed. Farouk Hormo was presumably leading the whole show, and she would later actually be deposed briefly by a Shapur Chavarez. And he wouldn't actually reign for long, as later on the Parsec would install Azar to the throne in 631 CE. And, and when this happened, Farouk Hormoz would actually offer his hand in marriage to Azar. This was important, as a marriage between Farouk Hormoz and Azar could have meant a union between Parsec and Palav forces. Now, upon the rejection, Farouk Hormoz the madman would actually just make himself king and declare himself the strongest in the land. And this would piss off the Parsic faction because they had Azar put on the throne for the very reason of pa Parsic domination. So they tasked a certain ally of the Parsic and part of the Mikran family that were related to Chavarez and Shapur Chavarez to kill off Farouk Hormoz. A certain Razi Sia Vashki would be able to kill Farouk Hormoz. Now, once he heard news of his dad's murder, Rostam basically left his position in Khorasan and went all the way to the capital, defeating every Parsic army along the way, blinding and then killing Azar and also killing uh, Razi Sia Vashki, then appointing Buran as queen because she was basically acting as an arbiter for the Sassanids until the ascension of Yazgurd III or a different Sassanid candidate. Now with Kareem Buran acting as ruler of the empire as well as Rostam acting as commander of all the Persian forces, it gave a lot of power to the Palav group since two of their candidates had such high positions whereas the Parsig only had Feruzin so it did create an unequal balance of power that we will see uh, become an issue later on. Now, after defeat after defeat with the Arabs, the Sassanids now unified with the Parsic forces, and with aid from Sambat Bragrutani's descendant, Jalinus, the Sassanids were able to actually have one victory over the Arabs, and that would be at the Battle of the Bridge. Now, this victory was possible because of cooperation from all the forces as a single unit under Rostam, and probably the one time militarily, the Sassanids could have pushed back the Arab forces. However, during the battle, as Sassanid forces were crossing the river, cooperation between the Parsig and the Palab broke down, leading to a major Arab victory, Parsig revolt, and finally, Buran being strangled. After this, the Parsig and the Palab agreed to cooperate with each other for Yazgur III finally taking the throne. And this hurt really a lot of the Palav trust in the Parsig. And meanwhile, after this defeat, Rostam favored negotiations with the Arabs, especially with the exhaustion of the Sassanid armies but he was pressured by both groups to fight the Arabs. He pushed for an isolated warfare and for commanders to bog down the Arabs before he engages. Now, Rostam with the Persian forces would send messages between him and the Arab commanders over how to proceed with everything 
And it's clear that actually from the letters that they were able to tell Rostam that their intentions were trade and that ultimately they didn't really care about the Persian territories besides the Oxus River and also Iraq ultimately. So everything else is kind of pretty much negotiable. The pressure from two groups and the Arab occupation of the Sassanid lands forced him to fight and they also feared Rostam allying with the Arabs and then overpowering the two groups. So because it leads to the Battle of Kedisa and well as expected it's a loss and even with the support of all the factions, the exhaustion of the Sassanid army leading to a lack of experienced forces, equipment, manpower, as well as the plague that ravaged the Sassanids killing Quebec, and on the loss of the battle came down to actually not even both of those situations but rather the fact that there was a lack of nobles and the leading nobles were either dying or running away from the battlefield. This would cause armies that they were leading scatter as they had no allegiances to anyone but to the nobles themselves. And and because of this, well, you just had situations where people would just leave the battlefield, like Pharaoh Zin, who would leave the battlefield with more forces from the Parsi group, leaving behind whole armies for the Arabs to destroy and conquer. Now, Rostam would die in the battle, destroying the one thing that kept the Parsig and the Pahlav armies together, leading the path for the capital for the Arab force. And after when the capital was captured, uh, the remaining forces at Jalula would be defeated as well, and in subsequent battles this would be a common case due to lack of leadership plague filled destroyed exhausted army with their morale being at an absolute lowest the Arabs would actually use stipend to convince that Persian forces to defect and join the Arabs which is a brilliant tactic and it's at this point the two sides are collapsing Pharaoh Zin is really the only person able to gather forces for the Parsig, and while the Palav are stuck with Baruch Zod, after defeat and after defeat, a much older Yazgrid would write to both sides asking for assistance at uh, Nehabad. And this would indeed happen, but it again was a defeat with the infamous Pharaoh Zin killed in either the chaos of the battle itself or from fleeing the battle. And the Arabs would deal with the surviving Parthian nobility during these conquests by either promoting lesser nobility to rule over much older and prestigious noble family or by assisting one Parthian family in taking out their regional rival and we will see more of this later on. It's at this point the only Palav leader left is good old Farouk Zod who throughout this whole invasion was tasked with guarding the last Sassanid king Yazgrid. Now the right race is on. Yazgrid will move south from the capital, says Stefan, with as much gold as he can carry. The royal treasury with ya uh, Farouk Saad's army as escort, eventually moving to Sistan, staying there for five years, then moving north through Khorasan, finally ending up deeper into Khorasan near Merv. Now it's during this period where the leaders from the Parsig and the Palav camps would make separate treaties with the Arabs, agreeing to the Jizya, provide forces for the Arabs when needed for tax exceptions. Many Parthians were allowed to continue ruling, as is providing more proof to the argument that the Arabs did not want Iranian territory. This came as no surprise, but as the Arabs were pushing deeper and deeper into Parsic power bases in Fars and Palav power bases in Ray and Tabaristan, and they were eventually destroying dynastic uh, Parthian family after dynastic Parthian family, or at least incorporating them into their empire. So, however, we will discuss later how these certain family members would be able to get better deals from the Arab. Him and his treasure and loyal Farouk Zod would be where our story of Yazgrid takes place. Now remember that Yazgrid was about 8 years old at about 632 when he actually became king and then reached Coruscant at 26 years old. So this guy had no experience with ruling and was always being manipulated by different factions. And Yazgrid's game plan was very simple. It was either go to the Turks, hide there, or go to China and hide there. He claims that he could get favors from these parties, ignoring the fact that the Turks wouldn't help him because he's a weak king with no support. And China would never help him due to the fact that, well, much of the same with the Turks, but also that they never cared about the Sassanids. And you have to go through a, a desert in order to actually reach the Middle East. You'd have to go through the Gobi Desert, go through Central Asia, and then finally end up in Iranashah territory. And even then, they have to go through the hazardous terrain of Iran. It would be a logistics nightmare for the Chinese army. A later descendant of his would try and do the same thing, but 
he will we will leave that for a separate video with parthian support all going to the arabs when yazgrid told the persians plan the persians were practically pissed at them their idea was for the yazgrid to surrender to the arabs allowing the king uh, to rule over the empire and aiding his arab overlords and indeed this is probably the right answer yazgrid didn't want to do this believing he could still maintain the Sassanid empire in any case after this argument Farrakh khan would leave yazgrid to khorasan actually the yazgrid refused to come with him to Tabaristan and Farrakh Khan would later surrender to the Arabs aiding them in the conquest of Ray and this was due in large part for a desire to take out a dynastic rival claiming his lands. Now Zagazgrid was all too happy Farrakh Khan leaving because he feared Farrakh Khan's power over him and trusted the Mars band of Khorasan, a low birth Kanaragi and Parthian nobleman who was put by their by Yazgrid III so he figured he probably owed his position to him. If Yazgrid surrendered, the war would probably be over, as the Arabs were just trying to catch him at this stage. They only wanted to capture him so that they could stop the Parsig and the Palev or any other forces from attacking the Arabs to put the Sassanids back on the throne. But Yazgrid again refused to listen. Honestly, in their minds, it was better to be ruled by a Persian overlord than ruled by an Arab than Arabs ruling over Persian lesser nobles and whatever. So ultimately, Farrakh Khan, however, telling Yazgrid over and over again to not trust the Mars band and to just surrender to the Arabs, Yazgrid again didn't listen, and you know, it kind of proves that in one belief of Yazgrid, of him being depicted as a spoiled and stubborn child, maybe the path to where he wanted to escape to the Turks really just shows that. Yazgrid, however, had little places to go in truth. The last bastions of the Sassanid Empire down south of the Canaragian Parthian family territory denied him entry and they would later sign a separate treaty with the Arabs surrendering it, paying the jizya, but also getting aid to take out a nearby dynastic rival in Farrakh Khan with the Isba Budhan, destroying the Mikrons and the Canaragians, destroying the Karen. Happy ending for all. Many cities later west of the Oxus would come to peace with the Arabs separately, disintegrating the Sassanid Empire further, and following Farrakh Zod's and Kanarangian betrayal, some cities and groups would instead be given a choice to provide manpower and troops instead of paying a jizya tax like the tribes in Darband, accepting them from jizya tax on the year they fought and being left alone, so all around good deals being made. And with the last great war of antiquity ravaging the two empires in the dynastic struggle that gripped Iran, it was very easy for the Arabs to attack and conquer the Sassanids. Uh, also add in a plague here and there, and yeah, it was just extremely easy. The main areas of focus for them was Iraq and Transoxania, and the presence in the um, Iranian territory would actually be very small, the Arab presence in the Iranian territory, preferring to only pass through it in order to get the trade opportunities, and the dynastic factionalism made this goal for them so much easier. It's at this point, all the support for the Sassanids once had from the Parsig, the Palav, the Mehran, the Kanarangans, the Isba Burhan, Baruxad, Peruz, all the other Parthian family, um, dynastic families were gone. And after a rebellion in Khorasan, Yazgrid would actually be killed. And the story goes that he was killed by a miller, but he was probably betrayed by the Mars ban or killed in the rebellion as a consequence of his unpopular policies and rule. People just really didn't like him. And the Arabs would probably let him rule too as a puppet, and the Turks and China were never going to help him without Parthian support, which again has been the whole topic of this video is that without Parthian support, the Sassanids were nothing. The decentralized empire gave Sassanids huge advantages and huge success over all of their enemies, and they were destroyed in the end. So in conclusion, the Sassanids were probably better off as a decentralized state. The empire was very successful as a decentralized state in this like period where the Sassan monarchy didn't mess with the Parthians all too much. And the centralization of Quebec onwards really damaged relations to the point where the empire was broken up into two separate blocks. This decentralized state on multiple occasions beat off Kushans, Hephalites, Turkic tribes, and Byzantines all at the same time. No pushover at all. And if these Sassanid kings wouldn't agitate or kill off Parthian dynast, then maybe there wouldn't be souring of relations during the reigns of Hormoz and Hosro II, in addition to the Sassanids continuing the war for three decades. But they exhausted their own forces, and they got too cocky. In fact, Hosro II got too ambitious. They exhausted a lot of the Parthian forces, and that led to the Islamic conquest being so easy. Again, the Parthian nobility would also rule through the Arabs after Yazgrid. In fact, Farouk Zad would have, um actually control over an independent kingdom in Tabaristan and Arab colonization was small in Iran the Shah comparison to Iraq and Egypt approving the trade reason even more so the Arabs coming during the end of the last great war of antiquity and the dynastic struggle plaguing the Sassanids and also cue in the plague again was probably the best time for them to strike stopping them from suffering the same fate as the Sassanid Empire 
Now, much like the Parthians and the Sassanids, the Romans would also lose territories where alienated elite would ally with the Arabs, particularly in Syria, Egypt, and Africa, where they would develop strong ethnic differences as well as confessional differences with the culture of the Byzantine Empire as well as with the Byzantine Church. However, because the military apparatus of the empire was not dependent on these nobility, as well as the Arabs not being as motivated to cross through to Europe, as they were to get to the Oxus, I think that basically stops the Arabs advancing into the Byzantine Empire, so stopping them from suffering the same fate as the Sassanid Empire. But that's an oversimplification, and I feel like I'll probably do a video individually on the Byzantines as to by why they were never invaded in totality by the Arabs. And really, under the queenship of Buran and Rostam, the Sassanids had the best chance to win, or Vyazgr just surrendered. Now, with the descendants of Sassanids, we'll leave for a future video. I foreshadowed their involvement with the newly created Muslim Empire, but this video is getting too long, and keeping in mind that they didn't have Parthian support, and the Sassanid Empire was a decentralized confederacy between Sassanids and Parthians. Without Parthian nobility, there is no Sassanid Empire. The power of nobility is so great that their own capitals were just as rich and powerful as the Sassanid monarch's kingly cities. That's basically all I have to say, and now I know that there are popular videos that are in direct conflict with the things that I have said, and that's for another time. For now, this video is done and thank you guys for watching and took about a year to make this mostly because of my laziness and pros but i'm happy to actually release this baby and i'll try to get out future videos faster I, if you want to hear my opinions on the sources stick around and i'm finally glad to give this overlooked empire some justice that it deserves and keep in mind that the major crime here that makes it hard to peg down sassanid information is that there's just the a lack of information and it's only now from newer sources that people have been able to expound on the the history of this great empire bye bye okay so now we get on to spoilers and i'm probably not going to edit this at all so if i breathe or whatever that's just something you guys have to deal with and this is wow i'm finally done with this video it took a year it took a year for this to be made and that was because it took me like maybe two weeks to read like two pages and that's just because I was just so bad at managing my time and whatever that, like, you know, it just took longer and longer. And then I had to move and then all this shit happened. So, like, you know, it just, it really did, like, take longer and longer and delayed over and over and over again. So, it was definitely later than I anticipated for this video to come out. But, hey, it's finally out. And I made it so that there were three parts first, and then I did the combined video. That way, you guys can balance out your lives or whatever. And I wanted to see, like, what would be better if I did it in, like, short, um, easy-to-digest, like, time pieces, or if I just did it in one big, massive video. So I just thought, like, if I combine the two, maybe I can get the best of both worlds, and maybe I can see which one people prefer. So there's that. Um, but I wanted to leave the sources for the end of this video, because ultimately it isn't really important for the narratives of any of you know the islamic conquest parthian confederacy nor the last great war of antiquity to know the sources that much except maybe towards the islamic conquest and the last great war of antiquity actually they're all pretty much important what am i even saying but like it would have taken away a lot of like time and focus right so i i just didn't want to necessarily do the sources at the end of the last video or any of the preceding videos beforehand so now we get on to sources so i used like a bunch of sources actually i didn't really actually list any of the websites that i used i did like look online and i you know saw like these small blurbs with like information and whatever but they didn't seem reliable and they also sourced books that i read so there's really no point i read it might as well read the books instead of read these shitty websites or whatever so books wise let's go into them first and foremost parvana Sharyati. i have used her for the entirety of the videos in fact she makes up 90 percent of the skeleton of the videos and it makes sense because of all the books her book is the most comprehensive it has the most information it has the most sources, so she uses Tabari, she uses the Futa narratives, she uses Shanama, she uses Ferdosi, she uses all, uh, she uses Sebos, she uses all of these different people in her, like, book, right? And she has the longest uh, chronology and longest, um, like, time span of events with the Sassanid Empire in terms of, like, pages as well, you know? So it's, like, it's a lengthy is a lengthy chronology of the Sassanid Empire and all of its dealings, but it's so detailed, it's so nice. You know, um, Dario Yitorogi's book, 
a book that a lot of people reference and a lot of people used, right? And people would consider him kind of the standard, the, the best of the best of, like, um, Sasanian information. His book is so short. His book is exceptionally short when it comes to the political history of the Sasanian Empire. And, like, when I tried to make the topic for this video on what caused the fall of the Sasanian Empire, it was, he just barely even mentioned it. Barely did. It was just so pathetic, actually. Like, he just kind of just skims over huge chunks of information and doesn't really go into any detail for them. So, it was a little bit of a shame, actually. Because I read Dari Toreji's book at first, actually, before Parvana Porshayati, and I found it to be lacking. I really did, you know? And it makes sense, because Dari Toreji's book is more about the culture and, I guess, religion of the people instead of, like, a political history, so that's why his political history video is so short. Ignore the siren. <laughs> but, yeah, like, Par Parvana Porshayati's book is longer, it has more details, it talks about the fall of the Sassan Empire in much greater detail, and, you know, the book is focusing on the fall of the Sassan Empire, of course, but, like, it is so much better than Dario Yutoraji's book. Like, Dario Yutoraji's book is, like, a YouTube video of, like, the entire history of the fall of the Sassan Empire, and Parvana Porshayati's book is, like, damn, this is an actual, like, good historian. Not to say that Dario Yutoraji is a bad historian by any stretch. He's actually quite wonderful. And I have read, like, a lot of his work, and I've watched his lectures or whatever, but it was just lacking. It was just lacking. His, like, his whole chronology and political history of the Sassan Empire just went by so fast, whereas, like, you know, Parvanan Porjati takes the time and effort and uses all these different sources to give you the most comprehensive, detailed analysis of the entire history of the Sassan Empire. And it's really through her that I was able to figure out why the fall of the Sassan Empire happened, what was the Sassan Parthian Confederacy all about, why did the last great war of antiquity lost, why did the Islamic conquest get so successful as it did, like, she answered all those questions. And Daria Tordaji, he does answer these questions, but very, very poorly, I feel, and with very little detail. And the problem is, too, is that Daria Tordaji and Parvana Porshayoti are at odds with each other, you know? Um, both of these books that they made are not similar at all. You see, because Parvana Porchariti is talking about a completely different timeline. She's going more into detail with the Sassanid Party and Confederacy. She is um, talking about the last great war of antiquity and how it was the fault of revolting generals. And Toriji Darayi, or Darayi Toriji, does not actually go into that at all. He does not talk about that whatsoever. He, um, he actually just, um, you know, skims over those. He doesn't give them any detail at all, and he attributes a lot of the revolting generals to Heracleus, which you could do, but it, I don't think that's true, because why would these generals who were so successful for so long, who beat the shit out of the Byzantines for so long, would just randomly revolt to the Sassanid side without a clear issue that they had with the Sassanid king? So, I just think that Dario Tordaji kind of is a little bit lacking there. But a common complaint with Parvana Porshayati is that her information is new, it's new, it's heretical, it's radical, <laughs> just a lot of different adjectives, but in addition to this, it's not well accepted, you know, it's still something that's still being processed, and Dari Toraji actually made an essay um, where he critiques uh, Parvana uh, Porshayati's book. He agrees on the new timeline with the Islamic conquest, but he disagrees that the Parthian nobility was as strong as Parvana Porchayati claims to be. So, ultimately, because of this, there is a contrast between the two. And he says that instead of, like, this dynastic, like, struggle that happened between 628 and 632, there was instead different kings that were ruling at the same time. Now, that's possible. That is all possible. And all these people were, at the same time, alive. In fact, it's um, because of Hormozd, now Fatah Hormozd, uh, he did mint coins at the same time that uh, Azar did. So you did have simultaneous rulership, you know, in some capacity. Like, if we look at uh, Porshayati's, like, version. But I, I don't know. I don't agree with him. I don't agree with him. It actually makes sense that the party nobility was as strong as it was. And it makes sense that um, all these events were caused by the, the party nobility. You know, we, we always talk about the nobility 
no, we always talk about kings and all these people, but like we don't talk about the nobility and the people that really run the show, the people that are in the background that people don't really focus on. You know, the names of these individuals like Sam Bagrutani, uh, Vistam Vindui, Bahram Chubin, all of these individuals like Chavarez and Faro Komos, Faro Khan, Rostam, that were instrumental in the downfall of the Sassan Empire. They're just blanket call them nobility is is bad in of itself you need to really detail these individuals and their reasons for revolting but also in addition like to say that they weren't as powerful is ludicrous you know it does it does seem like as though the Sassanid empire was not as everybody says it was and it was more decentralized you know and their efforts to centralize was really their downfall granted granted you know um i do agree with daria tortoji that i think Parvanat Pursharati, she has a later chapters in the book which details the religions of the Sassanid Empire and how they played a role in the downfall, but I personally don't buy into that too much. Um, mostly because I feel like because of the usage of Armenians, religion, while it was an important thing, like the Zoroastrian clergy was important, I, I feel like, you know, they definitely could ignore uh, in certain circumstances, the religious affiliation of someone in the, you know, in the name of, like, keeping power or whatever. So, that's basically all I have to say, you know, like, Diary of Twitter book is short, and it's, in my view, incorrect, you know, and Parvana Portia's book is long and detailed and is completely correct in my book with the exception of her religious uh, chapters. And ultimately... All of the arguments that I made in these videos are by Parvana Porsche So, if I were to recommend Dara Yi Toraji, it would ultimately be my undoing, as then it would invalidate all the videos that I made. So, that's basically where I stand on these two books. I would say Parvana Porsche is really the queen of the Sassanid history, and Dara Yi Toraji is good. I think, like, he is good. He is a good, like, source to also use. Like, you should read multiple sources so you understand what is going on. And I think he is brilliant. I've watched his lectures, and they're awesome. But in terms of, like, what caused the fall of the Sassanid Empire, the last great war of antiquity, and the Islamic conquest of Iran, I think he's flat out wrong. But he also thinks that Parvana Porcherati is right on the Islamic conquest happening much earlier. So, you know, ultimately, he understands that his own book is not um, as, you know, correct as it uh, can be or should be. And, you know, things are still evolving. Like, Parvanam Pusharati is coming out with a sequel book, which will talk about the Parthian nobility after the conquest of Iran, so that should be very exciting. Um, and what else? Yeah, I used other books. I used Keva Farouk. He is the same as Dario Toriji. His history is long. It is much longer. But he... He's the same entire trilogy is that he has like completely no relation whatsoever to any of the arguments that uh Parvana Pusharati makes. In fact, Keva Farouk in comparison to uh Diary Trilogy, his book has none of the arguments that Parvana Pusharati uses. He doesn't say that the Islamic conquest happened earlier. He doesn't say that, you know, the late great war of antiquity was caused by Parthian nobility. He doesn't say like the lost was caused by Parthian nobility. He doesn't say any of that stuff. He doesn't talk about the Parthian Tacitic Confederacy all too much, you know? Both of these are uh, authors, you know, Dario Torigi and Keva Farouk do not talk about the Parthian Tacitic Confederacy. So that's just a, a big difference there, you know? And that kind of like separates him. But he's he's good in military history. You know, if you want to learn about the military history of the Sassanid Empire, he's a good guy. And also, he also recognizes Parvana Pusharati's work. So it's not like these two historians are up their own asses. It's just their books are outdated. That's just the problem. Who else did I use? I used uh, Michael Axworthy as well. I found his book on assassins to be short. And it really didn't detail anything at all. So I just read it and I was like, well... That kind of sucks. He He's a really good author. He actually died recently, which is a shame. But, like, his book is just so short, you know, on the Sassanids. I think he does focus a little bit more on, you know, modern or uh, later history of the, the Iranian history or whatever. So, that's something else. Homo Kutuzan is someone I also used. Um, but his chapter on the Sassanids is also fairly short. He focuses more on the modern history of Iran. So, there is that. 
I also linked down below in the descriptions the essay in which Dario Tortigi comments on Parvenant Portrait's work. But if I have to say anything, it's that Parvenant Portrait's work is instrumental in learning about the Sassanid history. If you don't read her book, your anything you talk about with the Sassanid Empire is irrelevant because nobody else, in terms of the historians that I've read, talk about the Sassanid Party and Confederacy. They don't talk about why that led to the loss of the last great war of antiquity, why that led to the loss in the Islamic conquest of Iran. You know, they don't relate that at all. And without that relation, you you really don't know, like, what happened. Like, you know, it, you would basically say, like, oh, it was war exhaustion that caused the fall of the Sassanid Empire. But, you know, clearly with the narrative that I've brought to you guys, like, in this, like, video, you know, even the war exhaustion didn't stop from actual resistance from... Got cut off there. <laughs> but it didn't stop, like, actual resistance from happening. And it still happened, and there were still... You know, the Battle of the Bridge was a, in a instrumental success. And I think, like, yeah, the exhaustion definitely hurt. But, you know, in traditional narrative, there were... There was a, there was a lull period, you know? And then Yazgrid came into the throne. So, it was through Parmenon Porcherati's book where she... Uh, argues that the Arab con the Islamic conquest happened in Buran's reign much earlier and during this dynastic struggle that you see that it wasn't just a war exhaustion it was just all these like like different players trying to put a different Sassanid monarch off the throne at the same time causing chaos you know and the Arabs took advantage of that chaos the Muslims took advantage of that chaos I should say that more so because there weren't just Arabs you know and there were like like people uh, assassinated cavalry that did revolt and you know did betray the assassinates so there is that it wasn't just the arabs but yeah she she talks about how this all the islamic conquest happened while these dynasts were arguing about which assassin monarchy to choose whereas if you pick cave of farouk michael axworthy homo kutuzan or dario Torigi, they would say that the war happened and the army the empire was exhausted and then afterwards, they had a bunch of kings, and then Yazgrid came, and then the Arabs attacked. So, it just, I don't know, it just, it doesn't seem right. It really, it really doesn't seem right, you know? Um, and Darya Turiji kind of gives Yazgrid the third more credit than he deserves, so, I don't know. It doesn't, I, I feel like his narrative is just not correct. And everybody else is just very, like, brief, you know? So that's basically all I have to say on the sources. And, you know, in terms of this video, it was a breeze. I want to do another Fall of a Civilization video again. Maybe I'll just do one long video instead. Maybe it'll be... It'll probably mostly be an Iranian Empire again. And then I'll expand outwards. Uh, but I'm going to try out some smaller videos to try and break it up. But regardless, hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know if you guys enjoyed this long video format or just multiple videos. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.